Yeah. Now. My name is Mark Hudson. I co-edit a magazine and website called Manchester Climate Monthly. Okay. And uh, have you been involved in political activity for a while? You could say, yeah, a long time. Uh, I came to this country in 1996 and uh, was peripherally involved in things like the Newbury Bypass campaign, which some of your older viewers may remember, and um, various other events and groups uh, since that. So you probably recognise what I mean if I say that we seem to get sort of bursts of political activity in this country that then sometimes quite abruptly die away um, and, and disappear. Um, uh, have you thought about why that might be? Yeah, a lot. Um, up like a rocket, down like a stick. And I've seen various waves of enthusiasm with, or more latterly, new websites and new networks and uh, we're going to do X and Y and Z. And uh, I've learned the hard way often to just hold back a little bit and see how likely it is for these promises to be kept and make a judgment on uh, how effective the people, what kind of track record the people making these promises have. Um, as to the reasons why things are cyclical, I think there are various explanations. One is you can lose. So for example, you campaign to stop the attack on Iraq, but the attack on Iraq goes ahead and a lot of your support evaporates because people feel well, now that the war started we have to support the troops. Or more recently, something that I was not involved in at all was the um, anti-cuts campaign. We're going to stop uh, the government bringing through these cuts and we have a realistic chance of achieving that because the Liberal Democrats are part of the coalition, we can put pressure on them. But then once the cuts go through, again, most of your support, people who were involved because they thought they could win, evaporate. On a more sinister level, you have things like um, the campaigns around climate change that sort of peaked in 2009 and lots of people put their eggs in the basket labelled Copenhagen um, and that didn't work. Um, so yeah, I, I've done a fair bit of thinking about why groups go, or why campaigns succeed and fail. And it's often, I should add, not purely external factors that matter. Uh, it's the internal dynamics of a group where people are hungry for power, status, they don't know how to attract new members and well, they know how to attract new members but they don't know how to keep them and gradually get them slightly more involved. It, it, the way that we organise is very much all or nothing, come with me if you want to live. Um, and so new people come along, they might come to one or two meeting and meetings and then they're not given any jobs that are commensurate with their abilities or with their desires and they're kind of made aware that the only way to stay involved in the group is keep coming to meetings. Now that's all right if you're a student or you're unemployed or you're a trustafarian or you're retired, but if you are a wage slave on 35, 40 hours a week and you want to also have a social life, then constantly going to long meetings in the evening that never go anywhere, putting time and energy that you don't really have into projects that as often as not fail, is not a recipe for sustained activism. And unfortunately, the core people don't understand that. Um, one of my sayings is, you don't ask a goldfish about water. It, it doesn't understand the concept. And I've met um, a lot of people, a lot of activists, who just don't get the fact, because they've never been wage slaves for any length of time. Or if they have been wage slaves, it's been part-time or casual or whatever. But grinding 37 hours a week week in, week out, where you've got maybe five weeks of annual leave a year. All of that, plus having kids or having a sick parent or having a long commute, you know, these are not the lived realities of the activist class. So they don't get it. Yes, I had the experience of having a full-time job while the occupation at St Paul's in London was going on. And it was, uh, it was very difficult to be involved because, because that camp, which is a relatively small camp, uh, was run by really a good three meetings a day, every day. Um, 
And to, to really, really be involved in the running of it, you had to go to all three. And the main one was in the evening when a lot of people working could go. But the agenda had then been set earlier in the day. Um, but also, um, I mean, those meetings, I think, you know, I think a lot of people's experience of political meetings is, is quite negative. Um, and... Uh, Doesn't have to be. No. No. My own feeling is that sometimes the there's a fetishisation of, of consensus which um, I have found quite difficult to make work in practice. And I've had a few conversations with people about this and a lot of them have said they've seen it work well in small groups where people know each other quite well. And there are costs for acting like a dick and there are entry costs yes. that you have to pay before you're part of the group. Yes, sure. yes. Um, that's an interesting thing as well, the issue of, you know, who's who's part of your meeting right then and who's not. And Occupy, obviously, anyone could walk in off the street. And, and just, often do. And, 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 and just uh, offer any opinion. Um, and, and it was, and trying to reach consensus under those conditions um, struck me as foolhardy. Um, so, so why do you think that we we want consensus? What what is it about consensus? That is so I, I I'd rather feel that people just they go to an extreme. They see that representation doesn't work. Um, they see that um, that you know people don't get to make decisions on their own behalf very often. Um, but they just run from that to the opposite extreme and in doing so often create something a bit impractical. Um, I mean, people are also, you know, they can also be scared of, of, of being too regimented as an organisation, so they have no membership list. Um, so, you know, who can vote on any particular day or who can speak on any particular day is just, there's, there's no limits on it so anyone can walk in. Um, so I feel like there's something a bit silly about just running to the opposite extreme. In, in a way, you're still being controlled by the mainstream culture because you're so scared of being like them that you, that you go to this extreme and then your meetings barely function. Um, I, 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 I find it difficult to talk about this with people as well because they... because there's been a whole discourse in which um, consensus decision making is uh, positioned as the most liberating thing in the world. And so people will take it, A, they, they, if I question it, they see it as a sign of bad politics, but B, they take it quite personally as well. Um, and I, I, I just feel that perhaps we need to be more practical about it. I mean, have you seen well-run meetings? I think it's, you know, it's good to talk about the positive things as well. You mean ones that I didn't run? That was not that was a joke. That was arrogance on purpose. I do lots of arrogance independently as well. Um, I was involved in climate camp in the early days, 2006 and into a bit of 2007. And there were some facilitators there who knew what they were doing and knew how to do it. And there were also some people who used what was I, I would call facipulation, manipulated facilitation where you prime a group and you make sure that they're in a certain emotional state and then you ask them a question. Um, the meetings that I go to in Manchester, and I can say this publicly because I've said this to the organisers of those meetings both in private emails and on our blog, are generally abysmal and are generally meetings at which you see one or two new people, you might see them once or twice again and then you never see them again. Um, the meetings um, use very static, rigid formats, uh, sage on the stage with people in rows, uh, people being used as what I call ego fodder. Having said that, you can be in a circle and it can be just as bad. I've just been at a meeting in this very building, uh, admittedly only there for the last 20, 30 minutes, but just because everyone is in a circle doesn't mean that there is no power in the room. Uh, not that 
as a bad thing necessarily. Have I seen meetings that have run well? Yeah, I've seen a few, and what I do, or I've seen ones that weren't as bad as others, and I, I have an old habit where I'll sit in the meeting and I'll figure out how I would have done it differently using the same space, the same time, the same money, okay, because there's no point imagining this wonderful world where everyone can have a huge open space and technology and mobile phones doing voting, that, that's nonsense. But usually, in the space that you're sit, sitting in, you can devise a format that genuinely allows people to connect, to find out what they think, because often they don't know, and often that's why they open their mouths and start talking in the hope that um, inspiration will strike them. And it might after two or three minutes, but by then everyone else has switched off. Um, often meetings don't allow people to get their emotional and intellectual needs met early on. And so people are forced to contain and constrain these needs. And then it all comes out in the question and answer session. Um, one of my projects at Manchester Climate Monthly that I co edit with uh, our words, we have this thing called the Meetings Charter, where we, uh, I can send you a copy and it's available online. We basically, the preamble says, the way that we run meetings isn't working. Um, if it did, we'd have a much bigger, more vibrant, growing, learning movement by now, because we hold enough meetings. So therefore we're doing something wrong. And we have to accept that people come to meetings not just for information, they also come for connection, for a sense of, um, of momentum, of, um, of, of hope. And if you sit people in rows and force them to listen to Professor X or Speaker Y from an NGO or Author Z, followed by a Q&A session, followed by people looking at their watches, figuring out if they can get the last bus home or if the child mind is going to be angry that they're late, um, then you're not going to succeed because the only people who stick around to the very bitter end and the only people who go to the pub afterwards are the people who are already clued into the networks. And when I bring this up with uh, organisers of meetings uh, at the end of long meetings, they look at the 10 or 15 people who are still around who are talking to each other and they go, there you are, Mark, there's, there's minglings happening, what are you talking about? because they, don't, they either don't know another way of organising meetings or they don't want another way of organising meetings which would reduce the amount of attention that they as individuals and that they as organisational entities get. They don't want to be the host and facilitator of an event at which lots of people talk to lots and lots of other people. They want to be the centre of attention. And that's a very cynical point of view, and I'm being perhaps uncharitable, but I've seen this go on and on and on, and I'm sick of it. I'm just sick of it. Uh, my feeling, too, is sometimes you see what you might call an organisation within an organisation, the few people at the top who organise among themselves mm -hmm. um, and decide what's really going on a lot of the time. So, were you involved in climate camp? <laughs> Actually, I was <laughs> very little, but you know, uh, these things seem to uh, seem to happen. Everywhere. That was a provocation. <laughs> um, and but but yeah, and this happens actually particularly in the supposedly horizontal organisations. And, and um, when you challenge people on it, some people will just say, "Well, practically speaking, that's the best way of doing things." And they may be right, but then I think they should be honest about what's going on, at least. It's also not sustainable. Because if there's an invisible clique, what happens is enough of the, the smarter people know that it's there and get frustrated that it's not being acknowledged and withdraw their energies. They walk with their feet. So you're left with people who are either too naive or too stupid or want to be part of that invisible clique and hope that if they stick around long enough, they'll be asked to be invited. And then the clique inevitably... Uh, implodes. What happens is people leave, um, people have personality conflicts, people find better offers to meet their emotional slash political slash sexual slash intellectual slash financial needs with other organisations. So the clique gets smaller, more work ends up on fewer people, mistakes get made, projects don't get followed through on, uh, the events that the organisation uh, that the clique runs or doesn't run, uh, 
become less successful, the clique um, is unwilling to hear critical voices and therefore classically starts to misjudge, they start to believe their own publicity, their own propaganda, and, and you get to a tipping point often where it doesn't just slowly decline, it either falls off a cliff or it fizzles out fairly quickly. So um, it's harmful even in, it's not practical. Even though people will say it's the most practical way of doing things, well, it might be short-term practical, though I would dispute that, but it's certainly not in the long-term interests of the movement, in quotation marks, in terms of the resilience both of the movement uh, and of the individuals within the movement. I think some of those people would say in their defence that it's quite difficult to find people who are genuinely committed and who will put in work and so the, the clique forms as a result of those really committed but, people. Okay, I read a dreadful PhD about climate camp. I contributed to that PhD. I was one of the interviewees. Uh, and the per if, she, if she's watching it, the person who wrote that PhD knows who she is. I won't mention her name. And in her interviews, she discovered um, something that it's actually quite hard for a new person to get a small job to do. Hello. Um, is this your meeting? Sorry, room? Room. Yeah, yeah, no, well, then don't apologise. We're, we're, we're squatting in here. That's all right. Did you need it? It's about to restart a few minutes. How okay. many minutes? Okay. Go. So, um, I have limited sympathy for the view that uh, it's the clique has looked around and tried to find committed new people. Um, the joke goes: the, the man's in the young man's in court. Uh, accused of killing both his parents and the judge says well before I've passed sentence is there anything you have to say and the man says yes judge before you pass sentence I'd like you to take into consideration the fact that I'm an orphan uh, in that very rarely do I see groups try and break down complex tasks into simple ones and make sure that those simple ones get given to new people uh, in a, with a buddy system so that there's a mentor who could help that new person. Instead, as mentioned in the PhD about climate camp, there is this dynamic where people are discussing a, a, an action that they're going to do and the tasks that need to be done to perform that and during her participant observation this person witnessed an established activist who had loads of personal contacts and knew where to get printing done and knew where to um, hire a van etc kept keeping tasks for herself because she knew that she could do them and new people who actually were explicitly offering to do those jobs didn't get a look in now you only need to be told actually your help's not really needed just turn up on the day and bring your friends a few times before you think sod this so if groups and individuals and groups were more sensitive to the fact that People need to be given small, discrete, as in specific, beginning, middle and end tasks, then I would have more sympathy for the argument that uh, it's hard to find people. Because there are lots of people who want to do something. What they don't want is an open-ended commitment. They don't want to be told, you have to get involved in this project in all of its glory and come to all of the meetings. They want to be able to and I've been, I've had this as well, I'm very busy and I have my own project, but every so often something comes up that I think, I really want to support that. So we'll go along to the meeting and I will explicitly say, is there something that I can do in the next week that will take me no more than an hour or two to do that you want me to do? And I just get looks of blank incomprehension. Or maybe if you come to the next meeting. And then, you know, I usually smile and I go, gee, good luck with your project and let me know how you get on and I'll publicise it in Manchester Climate Monthly. I, I'm old enough now, of, at last, not to make a scene and not to call them all names under the sun. But if you do not have a concrete list of tasks that can be done on a weekend or in an hour in an evening, don't whine that it's hard to find new activists because you've not tried really you've you've you're only really wanting new people to be in your gang yeah i've definitely seen a lot of people expecting kind of total commitment for i've a, been guilty of it myself for a project that you know 
has, has you know may have quite a minimal chance of achieving the, the stated goals. Yes. Um, could I take you back to something you brushed on earlier, and it, climate camp brings it up again. I think there's, for whatever reason, there's often quite a big focus on big spectacular actions. So there's this huge burst of activity. Getting and, your face in the Guardian. And, and it's around these that people burn out. It's really common to see people burn out. And the same thing happened with, with Occupy London. Like, there were people utterly exhausted mm -hmm. after that had finished. And it was something that was clearly going to be temporary, mm -hmm. Occupy. And the same is true of Climate Camp. The same was true of the, the anti-capitalist summit protests. Um, From which Climate Camp emerged. Yes. As an explicit counter to summit hopping. And what did Climate Camp do? Within four years, it was summit hopping. With no sense of irony. Um, my wife has a very good take on this because she was involved in the mid-90s uh, in anti-roads protests and then on to things like GM. And in the mid-90s, there was a culture that, you know, you could do an, a non-violent direct action with 10 or 15 people, get some media coverage, more importantly than your media coverage, feel good about yourself, feel that your group was achieving something. Um, and there weren't that many big national days of action. I mean, the first one that I can... There was a, the G8 in, in uh, 1998, but then the first big one that most people may remember or may not was the Carnival Against Capital in June 18th, 1999, uh, in the Square Mile. Um, and then the, then the summit hopping. And what's happened is there's been both a change in culture and expectations of activists. If it's not big, if it's not got tens of thousands of people, and if it's not on the front page of the papers, then it doesn't really count, which is, of course, completely against what we're supposed to believe in. But more importantly than that, I think that we have to acknowledge that there's been a real change in the um, economic situation. And so in the 90s, it was still possible to get by relatively easily claiming Dole or Job Seekers Allowance, being a student and still being able to go and do protests. Now, the laws around work uh, benefits, etc., have changed. It's much harder to blag. You end up forced at metaphorical gunpoint to work in Tesco stacking shelves. Therefore, we're not available for, for small-scale actions. Uh, and students are now so um, weighed down with debt that they're having to work part-time jobs, also not available. So even if there were still a, uh, a vibrant culture that validated um, the small-scale actions, even if we hadn't had uh, J18 and uh, the march in 2003 against the war and the climate camps, we would still have a problem that there are, there are, it's harder for people to be involved in, in the small-scale actions. Yes. I, it seems interesting to me, though, that there's, there's very little... It strikes me there's very little thought at all of creating long-term organisations with long-term goals. Well, that's bureaucracy, man. You don't <laughs> understand. That's, that's hierarchy. We're anti-hierarchical. Yes. Well, that's that's part of the that's part of the issue I I have when I talk to people about this. Right. I, so, so I say, well, I think perhaps you ought to have some kind of membership system. It doesn't have to be run in a fascist way, but a membership system so that you can protect and look after resources long term. Because if anyone can come in and nab the project and, and nab your resources at any time then no one will put resources into your organisation in the first place. Because they're, because, the they're, commons. Because, because they're not that stupid. Yeah. So, so you need a type of organisation that can look after resources, this is what I mm -hmm. think. Um, and people don't seem to make those types of organisations anymore. And that means that it's very difficult uh, for there to be continuity. It's very difficult for there to be long-term objectives. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, the, the type of organisation and the fact that people go for these big spectacular actions, um, they feed into each other. Mm -hmm. Because actually there's not much more you can achieve with the type of organisation people are using. Um, I think... Uh, 
I mean, these, these actions take up a lot of energy. They take up a huge amount of energy, and I don't... And, and you know, people even put energy into things like TUC marches while mocking the TUC for organising big marches. Um, because it's, it's a big action, and people seem to get inspired by these, these, these big actions, these moments when tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people come together. In a sense, I can understand it, but I... I simply see, I can see no long term thinking behind it at all. Yeah, there isn't any. And um, I, 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 don't, I don't really know how people expect long term change to occur while not doing long term organising. Have you talked to people about this? Because well, I just want to pick up on an irony there. I, just in the uh, meeting that I was in earlier today, they were lambasting corporations for only thinking short term um, on a five year time scale, and then everyone else leapt in and said, No, 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 it's a quarterly time scale, which is true. The quarterly profit reports have to come in, and you have to be making a profit, you have to be growing. We're very good at um, seeing the plank in other people's, uh, the moat in other people's eye, but not the plank in our own. We're very good at criticizing government for being rigid and doctrinaire and not thinking and not being joined up. We're very good at criticising corporations for being hierarchical and rapacious, and I'm not defending either governments or corporations against those charges. Those charges are true. Um, or government states, but anyway. Uh, what we're not good at is pointing uh, that level of analysis at ourselves, and, and when someone like me does point that analysis at uh, our movement or our subculture, we are um, not popular. Now, that's partly because, uh, speaking for myself, I don't set out to be popular. I'm not very good at it. Uh, I may be interested in it, I don't know, but I'm just not very good at it. But other people also try to criticise constructively, and they get nowhere either. Um, I don't think that people really think beyond the next march or the next report that their NGO is producing and it's gotten a lot worse with the austerity cuts because people are now nervous for their jobs. If your NGO depends upon direct debits from middle class people and those middle class people are losing their job in the public sector or scared of losing their job and are therefore economising, well the first thing that is economised is that 30 quid a year direct debit to Greenpeace, Oxfam, Friends of the Earth, uh, RSPB, whatever. So you see um, the NGOs having to deal with shrinking budgets. Now, when you are scared for your job, you are not likely to become a creative thinker, even if you were in the first place, uh, because you might fail. The whole point of innovation, creativity, experimentation is often you fail. Well... If you fail when times are good, fine. But if you fail when someone's neck is going to be on the chopping block and that failure is in the front of the minds of the people who are choosing which person gets the axe, then you're probably going to get the axe. And you'd either have to be a saint or a martyr or an idiot uh, to, to experiment. Now, most people are not saints or martyrs or idiots. I can see that's true in the, in the more formal NGO sector. I, I, find, I find the unwillingness to, to talk about this stuff a bit more puzzling in, at the more, let's say, anarchist end of the spectrum. I don't, really, I don't think that they're anarchists. I think anarchists have a, um, a real analysis of, of power not just corporate and state power, but personal power, emotional power, intra-group dynamic power, and the ones that I've met. Uh, but uh, but I, I'm sorry, I've interrupted you. Um, yeah, it is puzzling, but then these are people who are often quite uh, young. They've not done a lot of reading, uh, which I think is important, reading, learning from history. I think there's um, a problem as well that they've been winning in their game. They've been having some successes, they've been getting some publicity, they've been um, achieving higher status within their subculture. And it's only in the last three, four years, two, three years, that it's, the wheels have really started to come off. The people who were involved in the anti-war stuff then got involved in climate camp. Climate camp was a big success-ish within the movement. And then when climate camp failed, along came the austerity cuts and 
Um, so the, the anti-cuts movement, austerity, tax, um, UK uncut and the tax stuff and student movement. And there was um, in 2010, 2011, uh, there was this argument floating around that, well, yes, climate camp failed, but look at war, or climate camp has metamorphosed. Now, you can't use the word failed. But, you know, those te tactics, that energy, that analysis has now gone into um, students' movement and uh, anti-austerity movement. So for a long time, these people have been able to create a narrative that has them on the crest of a wave. I think in 2012, the wave has crashed against the shore. I'm losing the metaphor here. And people are a bit shell-shocked. And uh, I've definitely lost the metaphor. Um, but they've been winning. They've, in, they've been able to construct a, a version of reality without too much chopping of, of reality that said that they were doing all right. But I get the sense in the last six, eight months that a lot of people have woken up and gone, actually, camps, demonstrations, meet public meetings, these are no more effective than the NGO techniques of lobbying politicians and getting people to sign petitions that we used to laugh about. Oh dear, what are we going to do? Now, the real danger is recovery without learning. The real danger is that in a year or two, when things are really desperate, the marches will get bigger and the demonstrations will get bigger and the camps will get bigger, but we'll make the same mistakes again because we're not reflecting. So I'm hoping, and part of why I've agreed to do this, is I'm hoping that the people who watch this will go, what are these two white middle class maniacs talking about? Maybe they've got a point. White middle class male as well. So, you know, just ignore us, everyone. Yeah, well... Um, that's uh, that's more or less what I've been thinking that we 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 should be in a time of assessing what has happened, mm -hmm. and discussing what has happened and what has worked and what has not. I'm not sure many people are discussing that though, and I don't know really. Who wants to admit that they failed? <laughs> yes. How many of us are comfortable to admit? that we've wasted our time, our energy, and other people's. I mean, I think, it, I think it's possible to see it in a constructive way, mm. in, the, in the, you can say, well, um, you know, some positive things mm. came out of that. It also didn't work in a lot of ways, but that's a learning process. And so we've learned how not to do certain things. Um, well, who's this we you speak of, Kimasabi? <laughs> yes, well, this is the thing, I, I am not, I do not feel in a position, there's no way I'm putting this up on my blog, I do not. <laughs> Self-censorship is the most dangerous kind. No, but it's just, you know, it's my, hmm. I do not feel in a position to call the meetings of like, large numbers of activists and say, come on, let's talk about this. I don't have those social contacts. Um, Are large meetings the place to do it as well, well because everyone's on guard? I mean, it, your anecdote about the previous mm, thing that I won't go mm, into, you know, if there's a record, tape recorder running or the equivalent, a lot of other people who don't like you perhaps in the room waiting for you to either admit that you failed or say something that they can then take as a criticism and fly off the handle at you. Because the thing is, when we, we sit here, we talk about the movement's failed. The movement's made up of individuals individuals with emotions and needs and egos and so when we say the movement has failed and there will be people watching this who will be swearing and going I didn't fail you you failed I remember that time in 2007 when you said something bad in a meeting and other people were really upset and you they never told you but they were really upset and they didn't come back and so don't talk to me about the movement failing because it was you not me they'll be they'll be going okay yeah so what we need is people, these mythical beings with far more um, diplomacy and social status, social capital, uh, to try and gently persuade people who are feeling very bruised hmm. because they've devoted years and years and years to things that have failed. They're, they're not in a mental space where they are able to assess this. My advantage is, I've got several advantages, uh, one of them is that I walked away from climate camp quite early on because I saw which way the wind was blowing. I left in 2007, uh, explicitly left, because I knew what was going to happen more or less. Um, 
other people stayed involved for a lot longer and it's therefore harder for them and they're mourning a, a, a friend of mine said that he feels that a lot of these people who were involved in climate camp are in this deep deep process of mourning um, and so then you know you, I suppose what you don't do is you don't go to a grieving widow or widower and give them evidence that um, their dead partner was actually having it off with the next door neighbour and embezzling money from the you know the church roof um, res restoration fund and was um, kicking cats you know you, you wait a few weeks and you go by the way he wasn't a saint yeah I, it's difficult I mean I'm not I'm not a tactful person um, and, and so I find it difficult and um, I, I don't really you know so I'm, I'm trying to do this stuff on my blog and I'm trying to make it not look like an attack on people um, but it also, it bothers me that the people who do have more social influence than me uh, are not really, don't seem that interested. Well, in, in the, one is they would have to criticise themselves and their own actions. Yes. Not good. And two is, how do you gain social status? You do it by telling people stories that they want to hear about themselves. We're winning, you're mm. a good person for being involved in this movement you work really hard, you get a higher social status. So you're so heavily invested and you're only popular as long as you're saying popular things. You know, it's not that people, it's, it's not like politicians having to, well it is like politicians having to say nice things to win votes. It's the same in, in, in social movements. Do you, do you know um, a play by Henry Gibson called An Enemy of the People? Uh, no. I'm going to turn this off actually because I think, I think this is more useful for us personally. Okay. I've done... Um, <laughs> there's a video that I made uh, two years ago, me with short hair, uh, that I'll send you as well, uh, mm. called Mind, Mind Your Language, Talking About the Apocalypse. Um, I did that in 2010. Okay, mm. so... Uh, there's a play by Henrik Ibsen uh, called An Enemy of the People, and the plot follows a beloved doctor, Dr. Stockman, think who uh, is that avuncular now I may be misremembering but not by much he's the kind of avuncular doctor who's helped women give birth he's helped ease the passage of the dying he's considered wise and he's, he's just beloved of everyone this is, and the, this is in a town up in Norway now the town has been going through some economically bad times but they've just opened a health spa and they've reasonably good expectations of attracting people from all over Europe to come and take the waters and get the health back. And then Dr. Stockman does something a bit foolish. He analyzes the quality of the water at this health spa and he discovers that far from it being healthy, it's actively dangerous. So then Dr. Stockman starts telling people and they politely say, that's very interesting, shut up. And what Dr. Stockman learns through the course of the play is that the mayor and the you know, chief of police and the chamber of commerce and the priest and everyone, they really, really love Dr. Stockman as long as he shuts up about the water because if he doesn't shut up, he will harm their economic and cultural and religious um, uh, benefits and, 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 and profits. Um, and that's the play. Mm. And basically, uh, that's the place we find ourselves in as a species. Um, as long as we continue, we will be listened to if we tell nice, soothing lullabies. But if you are committed to the truth, then don't expect to be popular because you're not going to be. It's, it's, that's a pretty banal message. Great play. I haven't done it justice, but that's the message. And... Um, that's the point at which you could cut the, there if you wanted to put that in. But I would say that your um, people of social status, if they did organise these sorts of meetings, they would suddenly find that they became like Dr Stockman. Now, that, that's because it's meetings. If you, if you sent out discussion documents and you asked people to... Short discussion documents, short provocative questions, and then you ask people to anonymous, anonymously submit to a website where names were stripped out and things that would tend to identify individuals were stripped out, 
that could be phenomenally useful. But that's a level of abstraction and a sort of metacognition that we don't have. But you've tried to do this a little, haven't you? Ending activism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we tried, and we'll try again. Um, I'm, I'm kind of not interested in the non-violent direct action crew. I just, I, it's not where it's at at the minute. I'm not saying I've become a friends, friends of the earth or a green party. I just think that um, we're not in that space at the minute, and and there were there were fundamental problems with the NVDA scene. Um, that a lot of us knew going back, way back in, into the uh, late 90s, if you've ever seen Do or Die, which was the journal of Earth First, uh, UK, um, there were articles very critical, not just of um, the misogyny and the um, sexual politics of um, protest camps, but of the movement more generally. We were having those discussions back in the late 90s, that unfortunately has been forgotten because there was a, a relatively distinct changeover of, of movement personnel. People had been involved from the early 90s up to 2001, sort of stepped back. There was a gap 2001 to 2003, and then after that, there's a new wave of people. Mm. Do, do you still want this? Yeah, kill it. It's fine. <laughs>